Welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Brent Compton, joined here today by Kyle Bader and Karan Singh. So we've spent uh, about the past five months inside of a, a lab provided to us by Quanta Cloud Technologies, uh, benchmarking uh, a lot of RGW Ceph clusters. And so we are here today to share with you um, what we found, uh, so our results, as well as some recommendations based on those results. So we're going to begin and end with the conclusions. And then in the middle bits, we'll focus on the empirical data as well as some of the concepts behind that. So that's how we're going to spend our 40 minutes together. We're going to try to leave maybe five minutes at the end or so for Q&A. OK, so again, we're going to begin and end uh, with the conclusions. So here's what we started off. So obviously, object storage, I think everybody uh, got that. Here were the architectural dimensions uh, that we considered. So listed there, so object size, object count. Uh, data protection, actually, we didn't consider that architectural uh, dimension because we only used erasure coding. Uh, we did some erasure coding and, and uh, 3x replication, but we focused mostly on erasure coding for this study. Um, we, one of the architectural dimensions was placement of bucket indices. So whether they're uh, on HDDs, whether they're on SSDs, whether you use uh, indexless configuration, so that was one of the, the parameters. Uh, likewise, caching. Um, so, and we'll get into more detail there. Server density, standard density we considered a 12-bay server, um, a dense server we considered a 35-bay server, so server density. Uh, likewise, client to RGW to OSD ratio. Questions that we hear all the time, well, how many RGWs uh, do I need? So that was one of the things that we studied as well. And then likewise, price performance, uh, because obviously, um, not all servers that offer the highest performance are necessarily the, be uh, the best price performance combination. So we, these are the architectural dimensions that we considered in this study. So again, as noted, we're going to start with the conclusions, and then in the middle, we're going to focus on the, empirical, the supporting empirical data as well as concepts. In the end, we'll finish with the same conclusions. Okay, so uh, there are four um, conclusions. So conclusion number one, when optimizing for small object operations per second. Um, so we found that a 12-bay uh, OSD host was optimal versus more dense servers. Uh, likewise, uh, placing bucket indexes on SSDs with a 10-gig fabric. And I noted 10-gig fabric, of course, there's you know, a 10-gig front end, 10-gig 10, uh, 10 back end, but as opposed to, for instance, a 40-gig fabric. Okay, so that's, uh, that's uh, effectively uh, number one of four. Number two of four, uh, so uh, when optimizing for high, uh, um, high object density, uh, so in this case here we had, oh, we topped out at about 130 million objects uh, in ratio to our uh, 210 OSD cluster. So again, the important thing here is the ratio between the two. Of course, you could have lots and lots of objects if you have uh, um, you know, thousands of OSD, so it's important to, to consider this in, in conjunction with the ratio. Uh, of uh, object count and OSDs. Uh, so with this, uh, 35, uh, 35-bay uh, OSD hosts offered the optimal price performance. Uh, and then likewise here, uh, this will be the first time you'll see the, the Intel cache acceleration software uh, featured. Uh, um, and just note, we cached metadata. Uh, so uh, more on that to come, but uh, in, in case you're wondering, so. And this was with most of our uh, dense servers, so anything over 12 or 16 bays, we typically opt for a 25 gig or a 40 gig fabric. In this case, we were using a 40 gig fabric. Um, so that's, the, that's number two, optimizing for high object density. Um, number three, uh, um, well, we have two number twos, so that's okay, it's, it's close enough. Um, so uh, the second number two, optimizing for large <laughs> object throughput. Uh, um, so this one here was uh, for purely performance standpoint, a 12-bay OSD host was optimal. From a price performance standpoint, a 35-bay host uh, was optimal. And note the, the bottom line, uh, the bottom uh, uh, bullet item here. Uh, it was, uh, we received about a 40% performance boost uh, by tuning one of the, uh, the Ceph RGW tunables, the, the chunk size. So 40% was material enough for us to note. 
Okay, so that's number, uh, number three of four. And number four of four, uh, optimizing the RGW to OSD ratio. Uh, um, so this one here, this is, this is what we found. So after, which means um, for, in this case here, we, we focused on writes because of course that's the, the most challenging, it reads obviously much easier uh, um, I.O. patterns, so the most challenging I.O. pattern, 100% writes, uh, focused on large uh, object versus smaller object. A larger object, see what you see here is after, after one RGW host per 100 OSDs, uh, um, uh, effectively adding more RGW hosts did not uh, make an, uh, uh, a material improvement in performance. So um, hence that ratio. Then likewise for smaller objects, uh, um, a one RGW host per 50 OSDs, adding more RGW hosts beyond that did not result in material improvement. Um, okay, so that's kind of, again, the, the format we've selected here is we're starting off with the conclusions, uh, and then we're going to go into the body, the supporting empirical data, as well as concepts, and we'll, we'll finish up right where we left off. So we're going to kind of keep this uh, a little bit interactive uh, with Kyle and Karan. Kyle and Karan were uh, not only the, well, they were the, uh, the architects as well as the benchmarkers on this project. So it began and ended with, uh, with Kyle and Karan. Um, so, okay, so first off, Karan, if you want to tell us a little bit about the benchmarking environment and methodology, just so you have the context, what the, what the lab looked like, et cetera. Right, sure, Brent. So, so here's the lab description that we have. So we have tested a couple of different configurations, so standard density servers and uh, high density servers. The difference between two of these is uh, on standard density, we were having 12 spinners backed by a single NVMe Intel P3700 for journaling and uh, one single 40 gig Ethernet. On high density, we have 35 spinners, 7.2K, and uh, backed by two of P3700 for journaling. And we have the other settings like uh, RGW host, number of clients, and monitor machines, they were, they were typically the same. So, this is the two configuration that we have tested in the rest of the study that you're going to see. One thing I wanted to note here, just, just so you're clear, it was the same set of servers. Uh, we effectively, we changed the configurations to, to make it look like standard density servers just because we didn't have a whole bunch of standard right. density servers available. So just, just so that you, you understand that. Go ahead, Karen. So here's, here's the lab architecture looks like. So our single rack with uh, uh, all the nodes installed in it. And uh, yeah, it's pretty standard, so front face and rear view of, uh, of the machines and the rack here, nothing fancy. And uh, here is the benchmarking methodology that we have chosen to, uh, to, to do our benchmarking. So we typically start with uh, doing the baselines, doing a single node disk baseline where we, where we install just native Linux OS without installing Ceph on top of it and, uh, and going through the normal FIO uh, benchmark, benchmarking tool to get to know how my disks are doing, what's the, what's the performance I can get from the disks, and what's the performance I can get from, from the NVMe underneath. So again, without installing any, any set binaries there. Moving to the next step, we used uh, uh, doing the full-fledged fabric benchmarking, making sure that all the network links, all the network paths are, are, are working optimally, and we don't have any, any problems uh, that we can later, later find out. In step three, we introduce Ceph layer. So we install Ceph on, on the nodes, and then we do native be benchmarking using Redos Bench, which is internal benchmarking utility present, uh, provided by Ceph, to get to have how my cluster, what's the top limit my, I can achieve on my cluster. So just to set a baseline, and then we can have real world, world workloads, kind of, uh, uh, obviously, synthetic using a cost bench uh, benchmarking utility. So in step four, we have introduced uh, Intel cost bench, which is, again, open source benchmarking tool, most popular for object storage benchmarking. In step four, we have done a couple of uh, tests using cost bench, and uh, yeah, that's much it. On, on the table here, we, we've used uh, RHCS, Red Hat Ceph Storage 2.0, which is based on Jewel, and standard RHCL 7.2, and uh, right, and Intel CAS acceleration software at the time that was 3.0.1, which was the latest that we have used at the time. So that was our benchmarking methodology, and uh, payload selection. So we have, uh, we have tested a couple of different object sizes, to, to try to 
mimic the real world workloads, like we have taken 64K object size representing uh, small images and small files. Then we have also tested a couple of bigger block sizes, so one meg, 32 meg, and 64 meg, and trying to, trying to mimic uh, uh, large images, text files, and uh, backup, backup files, videos, et cetera. So uh, kind, of a, kind of a ratio between small objects and, and large objects. All right, so Kyle, can you, can you walk us through? Uh, the one, thing, one thing to mention on the previous slide. Um, so this, uh, all of the results shown here, uh, it's about, we're about three weeks away from publishing the paper on this, so watch for this. It'll come out on redhat.com. It's about a 60-page document that has uh, all of the empirical results for all of those. Um, so Kyle, you're going to take us through first the concepts for this first one here, and then we'll look at the results. Right, so as we were starting to plan to do these tests, we had to think about the ways that we could stress the different parts of the Ceph system and what sort of workloads would be appropriate for kind of finding those, the edges of the system. Um, for the first workload, we're discussing small object operations. Um, when you have the Rados gateway, obviously you have your clients, in this case Cosbench, talking to the Rados gateway. Um, when someone is um, writing an object uh, into the Rados gateway. Um, the Rados gateway is first going to create what's called a head object. Um, and that's, uh, so the S3 object is actually represented by um, multiple objects, in some cases, um, in the actual Ceph cluster, which has its own native object store. Um, when you have a really small object, it is usually just what's called the object head, where it has a little bit of metadata about the object and the actual data. But along with that, because protocols like Swift and S3 um, support buckets that have an index, um, there has to be metadata associated with which bucket that, uh, um, that particular object belongs to, along with the, the list of other objects that are in that bucket. So when you're doing the write, not only do you have to write into the data pool, but you have to update another object in the underlying object store that has this bucket metadata, right, the, the index. So if you have, if you're writing a bunch of data into the cluster and you have multiple uh, buckets, one way that you can increase object throughput is by simply having more buckets because you have multiple indices and those indices are gonna be located on more OSDs. So you can kind of scale out the approach by adding more, more buckets and having more clients writing into those buckets. That works up to a certain point, but if those objects that hold the index metadata are um, under contention because underneath them, they're gonna be serviced by an OSD that has spinning media. So if you want to basically, that, that's a serialization point in the workload. So if you want to increase the throughput that a bucket is capable of achieving, the number one way to do that is to move that contention onto lower latency media. So if you're able to do more updates per second to a given OSD because it's faster media, then you're gonna be able to do more updates into a bucket um, and see higher performance. This also reclaims IOs that would normally be hitting hard disks, which you can then use for writing the head objects, which actually contain the object data. So it's kind of uh, double good. So yeah, increasing the throughput because you can reclaim it and now the buckets have more performance. So All right, Karan? so so these are the benchmarking, these are the numbers that we that we found in our study. So starting with again small object read operations per second. So the the key metrics that that we chose for for small object was read operations per second that we were interested in and uh, we have seen linear scalability uh, while increasing, while adding more load to the cluster by adding more number of Redos gateways and together increasing with the, the clients. So we have seen like, if you add more, more clients and more gateways to, to the system, you will see linear scalability. And uh, typically what we have seen is you are limited by the number of gateways uh, available in, in the setup that we have here. And uh, Incidentally, Conan, uh, how many worker threads did each client have? Do you remember? Each client having uh, 128. 128. 128. And uh, yeah. 
128 worker uh, clients each each client 128 workers with uh, with four physical machines so it's like you can just do the math we have, we have also tested different configurations of uh, uh, bucket indexing as as Kyle mentioned about uh, moving the bucket indexes to to faster media has really shown uh, good performance and uh, as you can see in, in the graph so if if uh, if you see the red line uh, the red bar here so as as soon as as i add more gateways and more load to the system i i my i i'm doubling my my ops per seconds so yes bucket index on flash media was optimal for for small object workloads in in our study that we have seen here and we saw a similar performance with the uh indexes on ssd as we we completely disabled the indexes so there's actually a way in the RGW to make it so that you can't list the objects at all. You can, it's just blind, right? You insert a key, and then right. if you read that key, you get the object, but you can't see the objects that are in a directory by doing a get against the object. So, I mean, um, that's useful for a lot of applications, and um, a lot of applications that have been designed to consume S3 or Swift are gonna expect that. So um, you can get as good of performance without losing that functionality. All right, so moving on to, to read, uh, to write operations per second. So these are the numbers that we, that we found in our study. So basically for, for write operations per second, we, are, we, we scaled sublinearly when increasing RGW host uh, in, in the test, test suite that we did. And, and mostly we were limited by the disk saturation. So, so we were applying the load from gateways and into, into the clients and we have seen uh, disk drives to be saturated by four ops, operations per second. So the disks were not capable enough to do more than that, like 100% hitting the 100% limit. So if we would have added more OSD host in, in the same setup, we would have gathered or we have, we have gone higher than this. So the, the bottom, line, bottom line is that we, we were limited by the disks saturation uh, in the same cluster. So as, as you can see in the graph, so as you can see this, uh, from moving from, from two clients and two gateways up to two clients and four gateways, and even increasing the number of gateways and the number of clients from, from on the system, I'm not able to draw more performance on the system. So it's like still somewhere around 30, uh, 30 31 uh, operations per second. And, and these numbers are, are normalized per OSD, just to, just to have a better understanding here. These are operations per second per OSD, not per, the, per cluster. We typically do that, uh, of course, as we're comparing standard servers versus dense servers. Of course, you can say, oh, a dense server offers so much more throughput uh, or operations per server. But of course, when you look at the unit uh, of cost, which is the drive, so that's why one of the reasons why we normalize per OSD. Yeah, go ahead, Connor. Right, and uh, right, that's it. And we have also seen latency improvements. Uh, we, we, typ we have typically reduced uh, uh, the percentile 99, the tail, long tail latencies by introducing uh, flash for bucket indexing, as, as Kyle mentioned before. So, I mean, the, the errors are like some messed up here. <laughs> Sorry about that. And uh, yeah, if you see this, uh, so in standard density server where we have 72 OSDs in the cluster for smaller object, which is 64K, and bucket index configuration on NVMe, we have reduced the latency by somewhere around, uh, for read latency, around 149 or 150%, which is pretty, pretty, pretty big for, for our numbers. And even for, for the write latencies, we have reduced by somewhere around 70%, just by moving the bucket indexes on, on flash media. And is, is this, this is P99, right? Because it says yeah, average, it's no, not no, average, it's, it's, it's P99. P99, yes, yeah, it's P99. Yeah. So, so long tail latency is P99. We have also seen similar behavior on high density servers, uh, 210 OSD cluster. So moving bucket indexes on NVMe flash has reduced uh, the percentile 99 long tail latencies for, for the setup. Okay, moving forward to uh, High object count. Carl can go through this one. This was the fun one because we made, got to make millions of objects. Uh, 
and we ran the test for a long time, so it was pretty cool. So underneath Ceph, um, when you have a Ceph OSD um, with the current file store backend, right? This is not talking about kind of like the future of Blue Store. Um, when you're using file store under, there's the journal, right? And then uh, periodically the journal is flushed based on either periodicity or uh, fullness to uh, XFS file system that's you know, typically on a, a, a separate partition. Um, within this file system, you know, the, this is just kind of pseudo, this is not the exact uh, layout, but it, it's enough to demonstrate the point. So you have the OSD, it's mounted into, you know, varlib, ceph, something. Um, and then within that, within that directory, there's going to be a number of placement group directories for the different placement groups that that particular OSD is participating in. Within that placement directory, there is uh, what's called a, a subdirectory. And the number of subdirectories is dictated by the number of objects that are being stored by that OSD. Um, when you have over a certain threshold of objects, which is based on your file store split and merge configuration, it will split. And you'll have multiple subdirs within the different placement group uh, directories on that particular OSD. And you continue writing, continue writing, and you have you know, maybe a third, maybe a fourth, ad infinitum. So you can adjust the file store merge and split parameters to adjust the number of objects in your subdir. So you have more objects in each of these subdirectories under the, this tree of data that has objects in it, which kind of flattens the hierarchy, right? You don't have as much nesting. Um, that reduces the number of uh, D entries that you have. And when you have all this information, when you go to write objects into the cluster or you go to read objects from the cluster, you have to know where those objects are in a file system. So if the inodes and D entries are in the kernel cache, then it's coming from memory and you don't have to seek to read where the object is going to be read from. Um, that's a good thing because RAM is much faster than disks. Um, there's a kernel knob that you can turn called VFS cache pressure, and you can adjust it so that it favors inode and deentry caches over other things like file system page cache. The kind of other edge of this, of this particular sword, though, is that uh, if you have a whole, if you have millions of objects, if you have a dense system and you have, you know, a bunch of six terabyte disks in them and they have tons and tons and millions of objects and, you know, there's uh, 4K bytes per inode or deentry, I can't remember the exact number, but if you have millions and millions of objects on a particular system, it's gonna equate to basically gigs of kernel memory, and you have to traverse this long list whenever you're doing a sync FS. So you can imagine that if you're doing lots of writes and you have a, you know, lots of objects hitting the cluster, that's gonna be somewhat problematic. So it's like either you have to read the stuff from disk or it's gonna take longer to write. And that's not really a great situation. So we wanted to find a solution. Yeah, so uh, in this we have tested a couple, couple of multiple configurations that we've tested. So we've tested default OSD file source setting, which Kyle was mentioning before. So, so no tuning applied on Ceph OSD file source uh, tunable things. And then we have tested a tuned OSD file store by changing split and merge threshold parameters in, in Zev.conf. The third testing that we did was uh, using default Ceph file store. Again, no tuning at all on Ceph side. And then introducing Intel CAS acceleration software and just for metadata caching. So there was no data cache caching going on in this, in this configuration. And in the fourth test, we, we, have, we have applied tuning parameters on Ceph file stores just to see how does it behave together with Intel CAS, excellent software, just to kind of have uh, how these four configurations uh, looks like in, in a performance chart, and which is the best one out of these. The test details were uh, standard density servers, 35 uh, spinners uh, on a single node, and we were, we were having uh, six of those, so 210 OSDs, and all small object workload, 64K. And indexes were kept default, which is Again, on, on the spinners, no, no tuning there. Each test, that, uh, each of these tests uh, ran 50 hours and uh, total 200 hours of testing. And 
filling the cluster up to up to 130 million objects. We want to see how does the system performs when when you load up uh, multiple uh, millions of objects into the cluster. So well, we didn't just kind of pick like an arbitrary number of objects. We weren't just like we're going to do 130 million objects. We did some math based on the number of OSDs we had in the system and um, took the number of OSDs in the system, figured out based on object counts how much memory inodes and deentries were going to take. And given that we knew that a certain amount was going to be used for the actual OSD processes for you know, their own internal allocations, we are only going to have you know, a certain amount of headroom for the kernel slab cache. And so the, the goal was so that 90% of the inodes and deentries would have to be fetched from actual disk. Right, so only 10% only of the inodes and deentries for the file system would be on these machines because we basically wanted to make the, the, the cache as cold as we could. All right. So uh, this is, so the numbers, the result that you're seeing here is uh, based on, on the configuration uh, three here, which is default CEPH OSD file store setting together with Intel CAS. So we have seen this is the optimal configuration in our based on the numbers that we have got. So just sake of time, we are, we are not uh, having the, all the results here. But as Brent mentioned, the paper is coming pretty soon, and it, has, it is covering all, all the things in detail. So coming back to uh, multiple objects in the cluster. So uh, the blue bar here represents the number of objects stored in Ceph cluster. So at the, at, the, at the end of 50th hour of, hour of testing, we were filling the cluster to up to 130 million objects that we have calculated, as Kyle mentioned. And uh, uh, the red line here is uh, representing the reads, operations per second. And as you can see that, starting from the uh, uh, first hour of testing, it was like, like 17,000 operations per second. And then it, it's, it's gradually coming down as uh, we are filling up the cluster. So in the, in the beginning of the test, you're, gonna, you're able to have more of the inodes and deentries in memory. And then as, as you, your population of objects increases, your, your, your cache efficiency in terms of cache hits on inodes and deentries is going to continue to go down. Right. And uh, this is, this is the, the slide which, uh, which explained about all the four tests that we did in a single slide. So. Here you have seen that uh, the blue line uh, in, the, in, the, in the bottom of the test uh, represents the default Ceph without any tunings, uh, file store uh, tunings there. And uh, we have quite a lot of things going here. So the red, the red line is a tuned file store, with a, uh, tuned file store without Intel CAS, and the violet one is a, a default Ceph file store with, with, uh, with Intel CAS. Right. So the interesting thing here is with the, you know, obviously with the default configurations, you see that you have this rapid kind of, like it starts out really high and as the cache, cache hit gets lower, um, because it is splitting a lot more, it kind of degrades in performance and then it kind of flatlines. With the tuned file store operations, you see the, you know, higher performance, but it's really just kind of pushing that cliff off the end of the screen, right? So if we were to continue to run this test for, I don't know, to 400 million objects, we would probably see a similar kind of dip at some point because you're, you're going to hit the, the barrier through that, the new split and merge threshold. So the, the solution isn't just to set like a preposterously high split and merge threshold because that can cause other problems, right? When you're in recovery, you have to, list those directories to compare objects and such. So you don't want to just set that to, you know, 400 million or something. <laughs> yeah. And, and we have seen uh, uh, somewhere around like 500 percentage improvement in, in read operations per second, comparing with uh, a default Ceph without any tuning and then default Ceph with Intel CAS. So it's, it's a big difference in performance. Okay, moving on to, uh, to the same kind of test on uh, and testing out write operations per second. Same, same graph with, uh, uh, with different numbers, obviously. 
The blue line represents again uh, the read uh, the number of objects, Redos objects stored on the Ceph cluster, and and the and the red line is uh, is the write operations per second. So again, it, you can see. So this one would be like more clear. Uh, so this is the comparison graph. So uh, the blue line is the default Ceph, which is. Uh, you can see you can see a drop here. So uh, this is what Kyle was mentioning before. So as uh, as the OSD starts getting more uh, write operations to it, and uh, it starts writing to uh, the PG placement group uh, into directory sub uh, subdirectories, it will split at some point. And uh, if you don't tune your file store and split merge values, it will split at some point and uh, do it later. <laughs> Sorry, it'll split later, right? So it starts. Yeah. In the, the on the blue line, it starts it starts splitting. It goes from having one subdirectory per mm -hmm. placement group, roughly, to multiple, and then it's balancing objects between them at around hour nine or ten. ten. And then it, it it dips for a little bit as it you know starts as more and more of the placement groups start to split into multiple subdirectories and balance the objects around, and then it kind of normalizes and flattens off. Right. So this is this is a latency uh, comparison between uh, uh, both the tests. So the right side is we have a right latency comparison. So first 10 hour of uh, percentile 99 uh, tail latencies that we have compared, and again using using Intel CAS, we have seen almost 50 500 uh, percent uh, lower and steady latencies using uh, Intel CAS with default Ceph configurations and. Uh, Somewhere around 100% latency drop uh, using Intel CAS. Can you add something here? Um, so a couple things. First is gents, we need to do the next two in, in like uh, four, four or five minutes. Leave a few questions for Q and A. Okay. The second is how did we get to Intel CAS? Is because of the Yahoo work. Uh, Yahoo had done some work with Ceph with Intel Cache Acceleration Software. We had read the report. We had known some of the people involved. It looked quite favorable. That's why we uh, um, chose to use this. Do you have any questions about CAS? I mean, we, we just use it because it looked favorable from previous reports. Uh, Armoon, you want to raise your hand out there? Uh, Armoon, she's from Intel. She can answer any questions that you have uh, on that. So, gents, uh, four minutes, the next two sections. So, concepts and then results, and let's see if we can hit the next two in four okay, minutes. Okay, quick, quick concepts. So, with throughput, you have your S3 object. Uh, like I kind of stated before, you're going to stripe that across multiple objects. So, when the object is over the 4 meg striping boundary, which is the default, um, you have the head object and then all the subsequent tail objects. When those objects are being written into the cluster, in the case of erasure coding, you're going to split them in, you're going to take that four megs and you're going to split them into, in this case, it's a 4-2 erasure code. So you're going to split it into four K chunks, which are going to be one meg each. Um, and then you're going to generate two additional parity chunks. Now, when those chunks are getting written to the OSD, by the RGW, they're written um, not in one, one fell swoop. There's a, a chunking parameter for the RGW, and it will write it in by default in 512 KB parts. So you can kind of see how you can take this object that's 16 megs, and it has all of a sudden turned into a whole lots of small IOs, right? Because you're breaking it into four megabyte chunks. Each of those four megabyte chunks is getting broken into uh, six one megabyte IOs, and then those IOs are further broken down into two 512 KB writes each. So you kind of have this, this uh, lot of operations from one put. When you're doing a, uh, when you're doing a read, I mean, when you're doing a write, I'm sorry, that's where this is most apparent um, because you, uh, it, it's writing out uh, in the, the 512 uh, KB writes. When you're doing a read, this is a little bit less painful because when you, when you read the first chunk of 512 bytes, the read ahead kind of keeps things going. And then when you have that subsequent read, some of it is coming out of the page cache. So not too bad on reads, but on writes, it can be particularly painful because you're doing lots of small IOs from one big IO. So you're losing some of the benefits that you might get from otherwise writing a large object to the system. All right, so quickly going through uh, the numbers here. So a large object 
and the metrics was uh, throughput, which is uh, mex per second we were interested in. And uh, the performance we have seen is it scaled near linearly. So uh, as you add more gateways, the performance goes up. But uh, for reads, they are limited by the number of available host, gateway hosts that we have in our system. Right. And, and the write performance scale again scale near linearly, but uh, we have seen uh, the performance was limited by the OSD saturation. So we have seen uh, severe OSD saturation like this uh, in, in the graph here. All the, all the disks are hitting 100% saturation, and uh, the disk can't do more. So definitely, if we need to have better performance on the cluster, we need to add more OSD host in, into the system. And this is the graph which Kyle was just uh, showing through his, uh, his picture. So uh, this is comparing, comparing with uh, default RGW settings with, uh, and uh, with the tuned RGW settings. So we are actually reducing the IO amplification going on here by, uh, by a big, big number. So moving, so 384 requests on through disks, and we, after tuning, we can reduce that to 48. And after changing this tunable, so RGW max chunk size to 4 meg, we have seen 40% uh, higher throughput uh, for, for the writes. Right, so, so at 4 meg, because we know that's the striping boundary for the RGW object, no matter what, we're going to write each of the erasure coded chunks in one, one fell write. We don't have to worry about having the, the EC chunks be further chunked down into smaller, smaller writes, and it, it right. clearly helps. <laughs> okay, the final one, uh, optimizing the RGW to OSD ratio. Um, when people are trying to maximize throughput, they want to know, okay, I have a given cluster. Um, how, much, how, much, how many gateways do I need to, to fully saturate the cluster? So uh, start out, you have your cluster of OSDs, and you, know, you have one RGW gateway. You have a client load, you're pushing against it, you'll add another client to it, and up to the point where you hit saturation. When you hit saturation, that's when you can scale out, add another gateway, then you can start adding more clients. And at, at some point, um, despite adding more gateways, the underlying clusters, the OSDs, are gonna be saturated, so you're gonna have diminishing returns. At that point, that's when you would scale the lower portion of it, where you would add more OSDs to the cluster. Yeah, so, so in this slide, uh, you're seeing a comparison between um, uh, 10 gig Ethernet for RGW dedicated and uh, 40 gig for, again, RGW. So what we've seen is 10 GB RGW gives better performance and better results uh, for, as compared to 40 gig. Quickly moving to the next one. So uh, how many RGW do you need? So uh, this is uh, based on the numbers that we, and the study that we have done, we came up, came up with, uh, with this number. So for 100%, if your workload is 100% large object uh, workload, so you would require, typically would require one RGW host with a single 10 gig ethernet for every 100 OSDs. So by OSD, I mean uh, spinners with journal on flash. So we have, so these numbers are valid for uh, spinners in IEC pool configuration. And how many I need is, is to fully saturate the underlying yes. cluster. Like if you're doing a capacity play and you're not accessing it frequently, then these right. ratios don't hold true. But if you want to get the most in terms of throughput, this, this is what we found to be kind of the, the, the right yeah. size. Right. And for, if your workload is 100% small object, 64K or a small object workload, so you would require one gateway machine for every 50 spinners. So basically, if you are running a 200 node cluster and uh, uh, it comes like, okay, how many gateways I need for a 200 node cluster and my workload is small object. So uh, it's like you would require four gateway machines. Bucket indexes on, on flash. I don't know if you caught this thing on this previous slide here. Sometimes people ask, you see the thing on the right-hand side, co-located RGW? That was co-locating uh, RGWs on OSD hosts. A lot of questions we get is, do I need to have separate hosts to run my RGWs? 
So shout out to Neil Levine here, Director of Product Management here for Seth and Federico, one of the product managers sitting there right there. You, you see them, they're the ones smiling, trying not to raise their hand over there. Uh, anyway, so this is something that they're working on is co-location of various OSD, uh, uh, Ceph services uh, on hosts. So this is, a, this is a sneak preview. It kind of slipped into the slides. It's not yet supported in Red Hat Ceph storage, but uh, possibly a portent of things to come. Okay, so that is, that is it. So here's the summary. We told you we're going to go through the conclusions, then we're going to go through the empirical data, uh, followed uh, by the concepts, and then we're going to uh, go to the key takeaways. So key takeaways. So first is, uh, in fact, it's going to take too long to go through this. So we went through it once. You can take pictures. You can read it later. Uh, um, uh, last thing we'll say is, that's what our team does, is we, we create reference architectures. We listen to uh, architectural patterns that you're wanting to deploy both hardware and software wise. Uh, we go into the lab, we reproduce those architectural patterns, hopefully answer architectural questions, and we publish. So here is a, a library of, of reference architectures and performance and sizing guides that are published. A couple to watch out for. Uh, there is this, this one that we're talking about right here. This is the first time we presented this in public, so that's about four weeks away. A second one, we're doing this. Part of the reason we did this work is because Ceph sitting uh, underneath uh, multiple analytics stores, uh, um, sourcing and seeking from a common object store requires uh, high performance uh, um, Ceph uh, storage. So uh, watch for that one as well. Okay, so that's the summary. So we'd now like to, now that we're exactly out of time, we'd now like to open it up for questions. Please. Uh, the the 40 gig on the RGWs or on the OSD hosts? The middle, the middle section right there. It was more. The, there's so the questions. So the first question is the the I/O depth. So I don't know if you want to talk about the the, the, the Q depth. Did we did we measure the Q depth? Did you look at the Q depth? No, I think. Well, so. it's it, it, it's like Q depth in terms of like. FIO? Yeah, so when you were testing you had FIO on number of calls, but the 128 threads. Those, those 128 threads, they were on from the cause bench. So cause bench is, is putting the thread, threads, and so that there's no FIO uh, Q depth thing on that side. Yeah, the like IO depth would only be relevant for the like low level block. baselines of the block devices. Block devices. Yeah. And then on this, on his second question, you want to talk about what we observed in terms of RGW's uh, use of more than 10 gig? Um, per, you know, per the conversation we've been having. Yeah, we, I mean, we saw diminishing, like we didn't see consumer increase in performance. Like w when we were saturating the 10 gig hosts, when we moved to 40 gig, it didn't give us you know, four times as much headroom, right? Uh, we tried tuning, uh, there's threading configurations for both RGW and Civet Web, so that you have more RGW threads that can answer and respond to requests. Um, but there's some, clearly some sort of contention in there where it doesn't scale well. We've done some tests where you run multiple RGWs on a single host with 40 gigs, and then you can see more. So I, it may be some sort of contention or locking issue. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, next, please. Uh, uh, maybe I think I missed it. Uh, what did you use uh, as a front end uh, before Redis gateways? Uh, HA proxy. So, so on each of our RGW hosts, we ran an instance of HA proxy that was just had one backend that was local, right? So we used it as kind of a, a connection shield. Yeah. So each each RGW has a single uh, HA proxy instance on the same machine. So the reason we haven't used a single load balancer layer was like we don't want to uh, have a load balancer such that to saturate, right? That's why we have used a single HA proxy in front of each RGW. Uh, but uh, did you use some load balancer in front of HA proxy? No, no. Oh. We, we had we had you know these two Cosbench clients talking to yep. this one, these two talking to this one. So for in each, a production setup, you would have to you know set up a, a, a just like a routing to right. distribute across your virtual VIPs or something. Uh, you said that you. You used quite a small uh, amount of uh, slab, yeah. 
So you used, uh, can you tell what the value of VFS cash pressure did you use? Um, I, it'll be in our paper. I, I'd yeah. have to go back and look. I don't remember offhand. So was we it tuned it from the default. I think we set it to 10 initially. So the idea is not to read from cache, right? Uh, we were preferring to keep inodes and D entries in this lab, if possible. Balanced, balanced with Intel cache acceleration software caching onto MVME flash. So we're looking for a balance between the two. Uh, uh, did you also uh, measure the performance of bucket index? Oh, yes, we did. Yeah, do you want to go to that slide? So while he's going to that slide here, there's been one gentleman with his hand raised in the back for a bit. Um, he's actually walking to the microphone. That's bucket index. Yeah, so we have seen bucket index. If you add, uh, move your bucket index pool to flash media, it, it gives you better performance. Uh, we have an issue actually with the bucket index when everything is working fine until some uh, users, uh, we have uh, pretty large buckets, uh, until some users hit the bucket list command and everything is just hanging until that command is executed actually. And uh, when I see the, the, uh, the OSD, which is keeping the bucket index, it, uh, it's uh, one, one CPU uh, totally, uh, one CPU, and everything is effectively blocked until, until that OSD finishes this job. So I wonder, <laughs> is it ever possible to is it ever possible to somehow tune it because, well, uh, we have one bucket with uh, five, 500 million objects in it, <laughs> and yeah, using bucket list is... That's the problem. <laughs> it's yeah. going to be a problem. Yeah, I That's mean, the th there are things you can do to make it better. You can shard, there's sharding for the bucket, so it yeah, spreads that bucket across a lot. Yeah. You can have faster media underneath your indices, but yeah. fundamentally 50 million objects or 500 million objects in a single bucket is... I wonder if we could do this. I wonder if we could just yeah. make sure we get this gentleman's question for... I wonder if we could take the rest of it offline. We invite you absolutely to chat with, uh, uh, with the team off, offline. Uh, please, yeah. A couple of questions. Uh, first one, did you use uh, HTTPS uh, for uh, S3? No. No, no we, didn't, we didn't get no. to setting up SSL for the testing. Okay. And the uh, second question is uh, uh, for Intel CAS layer use uh, just for metadata, but uh, aren't you using SSDs for metadata already? No, we were using uh, uh, the P3700s, so we sliced it up for journaling, and the remaining partition was used for caching. So Intel P3700 for inter uh, metadata caching using Intel CAS. So use faster SSD for yes. caching? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, we use, the same, we use the same SSD partition into right. chunks, so some of it was for the journal. Right. If, if you don't so, do, go ahead. Uh, so some of it was for the journal, and then we used the, the balance of the capacity on the SSD for Intel ICAS. Yeah. So ICAS would see, oh, this BIO is uh, a D-entry or inode, and it would cache it. Hmm. Nice. You could have created an OSD just for the metadata pools, like the index pools, out of those. Uh, parts yes. No, we did that. Cache. We did that. We, yeah, so when we ran, well, there's two separate things. When, when we ran the indexes on NVMe, we created separate OSDs with the balance of the NVMe instead of ICAS. Mm -hmm. And had a separate, in our crush hierarchy, we had a separate branch that had just the SSDs. And then we, we configured the, the pool for the bucket indices to take root at that particular point in the crush hierarchy. So I believe the next presenter is uh, here getting ready to set up, is that true? Uh, so we need to just to, uh, to make sure we have, so Thank you. Let's, let's make sure you come up and, and ask your question up here and we'll let the next presenter set up. Uh, thanks everybody for coming, hope you have a good day.